Hello and welcome to Prof. Dale's Property Video number 23. I'm your host, Dale Whitman. The topic of this video is the landlord's implied covenant of quiet enjoyment, a theory that's been developed by the courts to help protect tenants against the worst abuses that landlords might impose. The implied covenant of quiet enjoyment is automatic. You don't have to write it into the lease. It is deemed to exist, and it applies to all kinds of leases, whether they're residential, commercial, industrial, agricultural, or even just raw land. All leases are deemed to have within them an implied covenant of quiet enjoyment. What does the covenant say? Well, we're going to give a summary of what it says on this slide, and then we'll take the rest of the video to talk about each of these principles in detail. So here are the basic elements that an implied covenant of quiet enjoyment includes. First, the landlord impliedly covenants that the landlord has title or the right to lease the premises. Second, the landlord covenants that the premises will be free of previous tenants. Now, there is a split of authority on that, but that is clearly today the majority view in the United States, that the landlord will get rid of the old tenant before putting a new tenant in the property. Number three, the landlord covenants that the landlord will not deprive the tenant of any of the lease space or land during the term of the lease. In other words, the tenant will get and keep getting all of the space or land that they leased out in the first place. Finally, number four, the landlord covenants that the landlord will not unreasonably interfere with the tenant's possession during the term of the lease. So let's begin by talking about the covenant of title. Number one, here's an example. The landlord pretends to own a strip mall, and the landlord enters into a lease with the tenant. The tenant takes possession of one of the store spaces in the strip mall, but the landlord never really owned the strip mall to begin with. Then the real owner of the strip mall discovers the tenant in the property and removes him. So the tenant gets kicked out, and the tenant comes back and sues the fraudulent, putative landlord on what theory? The theory, of course, is the implied covenant of quiet enjoyment. The landlord who purported the lease to the tenant didn't really have title, and therefore the landlord is, has breached the covenant of quiet enjoyment. Can the tenant get damages? Without any doubt, but that's probably the only remedy. Could the tenant get specific performance? Well, unfortunately, if you think about that, it's impossible because by definition, the fraudulent landlord doesn't own the property and can't possibly give specific performance. But the tenant can get damages. The tenant, of course, also can terminate the fraudulent lease and not pay any more rent under it. A second application of the implied covenant of quiet enjoyment is that it's a covenant to remove previous tenants from the property. Let's see how that would work. Let's suppose the landlord has an old tenant in the property. The old tenant's lease expires, but the old tenant doesn't move out. Instead, he or she holds over for an additional month, and the result is the new tenant, who was planning on moving in, is delayed for a month in gaining possession of the property. Is the landlord liable to the new tenant for damages? The clear majority view in the United States today is yes, the landlord is liable for damages. Is this good policy? Well, yes, in fact, it's really a little surprising that the law was ever the other way around, because almost everyone today would agree it only makes sense that a landlord should get rid of the old tenant before putting a new tenant in the property. Now, the measure of damages that the landlord is liable for is not so great. The measure standardly is the difference between the contract rent and the fair market rent for the time that the old tenant held over. We refer to that as loss of bargain measure of damages, and the trouble with it is that it probably won't be very much money. Usually, there's not much, if any, difference between the contract rent and the fair market rent at the beginning of a lease, so the result is the tenant won't recover many dollars, if any at all, under this measure of damages. Sometimes the tenant will try to make that situation a little more palatable by seeking lost profits. The tenant may say, I was going to open my business in the property, I was delayed doing so for a month, and I ought to get the landlord to give me the profit I would have made if I'd been open during that period. Can a tenant recover lost profits? 
Well, the courts are usually very parsimonious about that. They'll typically say, unless the tenant can show an extremely strong track record of opening similar businesses in similar locations and how much profit they would have made by doing so, the courts will turn down the tenant's lost profits claim. Can the tenant terminate the lease instead? Well, under the old theory that the covenants in a lease are independent, the answer would clearly be no. But as we saw earlier back in video number 22, that situation is evolving and more and more courts are allowing tenants to terminate the lease for a breach by the landlord. In this case, terminating the lease is particularly appealing because the tenant says, I've got to get my business open. If I can't get it open here, I've got to go somewhere else. And it's simply unreasonable to expect me to owe rent in two different locations at the same time. So I think there's actually a pretty good chance that a court would allow the tenant to terminate the lease. Now, the third application of the implied covenant of quiet enjoyment is that it's a covenant not to deprive the tenant of any space. This is a covenant by the landlord to make sure the tenant has all the space they've rented. So let's imagine the following case. The tenant rents a house with a detached garage. Then while the tenant is out, the landlord comes around to the garage, changes the lock, and now the tenant can no longer access the garage. They still have access to the house, however. This is called a partial actual eviction. It's an actual eviction because the tenant is physically barred from access to some of the space. It's partial because the tenant can still get access to the house, they just can't get access to the garage. Now, obviously, this is a breach by the landlord of the implied covenant of quiet enjoyment because the covenant is that the tenant will have access to the entire space. But the amazing thing about this particular kind of breach where the tenant is denied physical access to part of the space is that the tenant is now excused from paying all rent on the house and the garage until they're restored to the entire space. The common law had a quaint way of putting that. They said that rent is not apportionable as to space. And what that meant in that quaint way of speaking was that if you don't get all of your space, you don't have to pay any of your rent. So literally, the tenant can occupy the house rent-free until the landlord restores the garage to them as well. Now, here's another application of that principle that a landlord has a duty not to deprive the tenant of any space. Let's suppose that the bank holds a prior mortgage on the property. That is, the landlord put the mortgage on the property before the landlord leased the property to the tenant. Now, let's suppose after the tenant moves in, the landlord defaults on the mortgage loan to the bank, the bank forecloses the mortgage, and the bank dispossesses the tenant. The bank, of course, is perfectly entitled to do that. Does the tenant have an action against the bank for doing so? Not at all. The bank is only doing what the, the bank is entitled to do under the mortgage. What about an action by the tenant against the landlord? Well, the answer pretty clearly here is yes, because what the landlord has done is to fail to make the mortgage payments, the result of which is to dispossess the tenant. So the landlord has really breached the covenant not to deprive the tenant of any space. The landlord's actions have deprived the tenant of all of the space. And therefore, the landlord is going to be liable to the tenant for damages. And of course, the tenant can also terminate the lease. Now, sometimes people wonder about a third-party criminal who dispossesses the tenant. Is that different than the situation where the tenant is dispossessed by the action or the failure to act of the landlord. Is the landlord liable for damages because a criminal has come into the property? Not at all. It's different than the covenant to remove previous tenants because in this case, the criminal is not a party who was put into possession originally by the landlord. So the landlord has no responsibility for the actions of third parties. Now, I have to caution you that in a number of modern cases where the area is a high crime area and the landlord is aware of criminal activity and doesn't take adequate precautions to secure against it, sometimes the courts have found the landlord liable, not under the implied covenant of quiet enjoyment, but simply because the landlord was negligent in behaving in a way that allowed criminals to come in and harm a tenant. Finally, 
The last of our four applications of the implied covenant of quiet enjoyment is that it's a covenant not to interfere with the tenant's possession. That sort of interference is referred to as constructive eviction. So constructive eviction is a wrongful act, or as we'll see, sometimes a wrongful failure to act by the landlord, and very bad conditions result. The conditions, in order to be a constructive eviction, have to be terrible. The technical word the tenants that the courts often use is untenantable. That is, they render the premises unfit for occupancy for the purposes for which they are demised. So they've got to be very bad conditions indeed. In addition, the tenant's got to give notice to the landlord of the bad conditions and demand that the landlord cure them, and the landlord then has a reasonable time to take action. And if the landlord does not take action within a reasonable time, then the tenant has to vacate the premises within a reasonable time after the landlord's failure to cure. In other words, the tenant's got to move out and terminate the lease. Notice that the remedy here, terminating the lease, is an exception to the independence of covenants theory that we talked about back in video 22, because what the courts are allowing the tenant to do here is to terminate the lease because of a breach by the landlord. Now, sometimes people ask, well, does it have to be action on the part of the landlord, or could it be inaction? And the answer is, it might be inaction as well. Here's an example. The roof leaks over the kitchen of the tenant's restaurant, making it unsafe to prepare food there. The landlord fails to repair the leaks despite many complaints by the tenants. Is failure of the landlord to repair a constructive eviction? Well, it might be. It depends on whether action by the landlord is required, either by the language of the lease or by applicable codes, such as a housing or a building code. If the landlord has a duty to take action, either under the lease or under applicable codes, and the landlord fails to take action, the court will almost certainly find a constructive eviction on these facts. So inaction, as well as action, can result in a constructive eviction. Sometimes people think that constructive eviction is a sort of a catch-22 because the tenant's got to move out in order to claim a constructive eviction. But if the tenant moves out and then the court looks at the conditions and decides they're not bad enough to be a constructive eviction, then the court might say, well, the old lease is still in effect and the tenant, as a result, ends up owing rent on two different properties at the same time, which is a very harsh result. One solution to that problem is suggested by a Massachusetts case called Burt v. Seven Grand, in which the court said it would be perfectly okay for the tenant in that situation before moving out to seek a declaratory judgment in which they would ask the court to find that the conditions are bad enough to be a constructive eviction. If the court said yes, then the tenant could move out with confidence that the lease would terminate and they wouldn't be liable for rent anymore in the old space. The remedies for constructive eviction, the standard remedy, of course, is lease termination with no further rent liability. You might say, well, what about damages instead? And my reaction to that is, why not? If you think of the lease as a contract, then the constructive eviction is a breach by the landlord, isn't it? The measure of damages, again, loss of bargain, the difference between the contract rent and the fair market rent for the rest of the lease term. Here, there might be some significant damages if the land value has gone up and as a result, the fair market rent has gone up over the term of the lease and the rent is still low, so it's a relative bargain and the tenant has a real loss when having to move out and terminate the lease. Could the tenant get an injunction or specific performance instead? Well, it's conceivable, but it's rather doubtful. The difficulty is that the court in a situation like that has to supervise the repairs. And courts don't like to do that because it puts them in the position of coming back with repeated hearings and repeated findings of fact as to whether the landlord really did make the necessary repairs and made them in a proper manner. So either an injunction or specific performance is going to be a bit of an uphill battle. Now we're going to wind up here by talking about the differences between constructive eviction and partial actual eviction, because it's easy to get the two mixed up, but they're really completely distinct. 
A constructive eviction, the conditions have got to be very bad, but the tenant can get access to the space. With a partial actual eviction, on the other hand, the tenant is literally barred from physical access to at least part, maybe to all, of the space. So the two are quite different in that regard. For a constructive eviction, the tenant must move out. For a partial actual eviction, the tenant can remain in the space that's still accessible and, in fact, doesn't have to pay any rent on it until they get access to the remainder of the space again. For a constructive eviction, the main remedy is termination, but possibly damages as well. For partial actual eviction, as we said, the tenant can remain rent-free and may also recover damages. Now, only a landlord can commit a constructive eviction, or for that matter, a partial actual eviction. So normally, acts of third parties aren't going to count toward a constructive eviction. However, they might count if the landlord has control of the third parties. Here's an example. Let's suppose you're a tenant in a residential apartment and the tenant in the next apartment to you persistently plays the stereo at high volume at 3 a.m. The noise is driving you crazy. The landlord's lease with that other tenant requires quiet outers, hours, that is to say, no un unreasonable noise after 10 p.m. or words to that effect. So you go to the landlord and ask the landlord to enforce the clause requiring quiet outers, hours against the other tenant, and the landlord simply refuses to do so. The landlord says, no, I don't want to get involved in the dispute between the two of you. Now, after you've given the landlord notice and an opportunity to cure, you as a tenant probably can claim a constructive eviction. So conceivably, the acts of a third party can amount to a constructive eviction if the landlord could have corrected them and refused to do so. So to summarize our discussion of the implied covenant of quiet enjoyment, it includes four sub-concepts. The first is that the landlord has title or the right to lease the space to the tenant. The second is that the landlord has a duty to remove previous tenants so the new tenant can get unencumbered possession of the property. Number three, it includes the idea that the landlord won't deprive the tenant of any of the lease space during the term of the lease. And number four, the landlord will not unreasonably interfere with the tenant's possession by causing a constructive eviction. That concludes video number 23 about the implied covenant of quiet enjoyment. In our next video, number 24, we'll discuss the implied warranty of habitability. If you have questions or comments, email profdale01 at gmail.com. And thanks for watching. <music>